Faithless Hijabi provides a supportive community for young people who have left the faith, along with access to mental health services and resources. But they need your help to continue their important work. Please consider donating to Faithless Hijabi and help make a difference in the lives of these young people. Together, we can provide them with the support they need to heal and thrive. So getting right into it, um, our topic for this panel is with Harris and Hane, both from Australia. So this is pre-recorded and we will be discussing the challenges and opportunities that apostates face in advocating for their beliefs in societies where they are minorities or rather lack of beliefs. And with that, I guess it makes sense to start with you, Hane. Um, you moved to Australia when you were an adult, so you weren't born in Australia then, is that correct? I wasn't born in Australia, but I lived most of my life in Western countries. I, okay. I, lived, I lived in Egypt for about eight years of my life altogether. Yeah. Okay, so you've lived most of your life in Western countries where I would assume you would then be a religious minority if you were, if you come from a Muslim background um, or even ethnic and ethnic background as well. But if we focus on your experiences coming from different backgrounds, how challenging do you think that the majority of people, uh, how challenging do you think it would be to convince people about one existence of ex-Muslims, the plight of them. Um, and also how do, do you find that they're averse to acknowledging that uh, um, ex-Muslims, even in a secular country can go through tough situations? Yeah, well, my situation is a little bit unique. I was born to a, a, a Muslim or an ex-Muslim father, Egyptian father. So by the time I turned up in life, he was an atheist already, and to a Catholic Irish mother who was a new age uh, Catholic. So she wasn't really kind of a, a Jesus or Bible basher type of person. She sort of believed in spirits and stuff like that. Uh, as le uh, sort of living in uh, European countries, I never really felt a problem. Uh, I didn't have really to struggle, but I could see other, um, some of my very good friends were struggling because they were um, within a certain system that would only allow them to, to move in a, in a certain way. Uh, they are sort of traditional Muslims and uh, they were supposed to have friends of the, of the same, from the same faith or uh, some even ethnicity at, at that point. And when they left Islam, this is the, the type of people that really struggled the most. It doesn't matter which country they lived in because they kind of create a, a ghetto, a, a, a community within a community. Uh, where Arabic is predominantly sp is spoken in, in the household, uh, Quran, uh, readings, reciting, and therefore the, the virtues of Islam are supposed to be uh, observed. So when leaving, uh, you know, leaving Islam isn't a piece of cake. Uh, you, you have to, to, to meet lots of challenges, um, uh, never mind the apostasy uh, punishment. A lot of people don't do that anymore, but still the... Um, uh, the alienation and, uh, you know, uh, not being part of the family anymore or being sort of sent out, packing on their way, have lots of psychological impact. Uh, as for the, the European residents uh, looking at these incidents, uh, they don't really understand them uh, quite well because they probably don't have an understanding of how Islam works. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that leaving Islam is a big deal because leaving Christianity isn't really a big deal. It doesn't have a punishment uh, of some sort, but it might have a certain stigma, but that's about it. Unless you're a Jehovah's Witness, that's a different story. That uh, can be quite harsh. Uh, but in Islam, it's, uh, you, you pay the price uh, quite, quite harshly. Um, I was lucky not to go through that, but... Um, uh, a, a lot of my friends went through that and it's uh, it's not it's not nice do you just expanding on that do you think that with your work on streams that you still face um backlash from people who may not understand why you talk about religion um especially within the countries so i'm specifically referring to people of different denominations than muslims or ex-muslims but why there is a certain focus on your side on the topic. 
Yeah, well, well, I, I'm lucky again that way that I don't focus solely on religion. I do a lot more science and philosophy and psychology, and then I bring religion into the equation. I don't go out of my way to face religion sort of um, conf confrontation style. I, I, I merge it with, like, for example, I'm having a debate soon in 10 days about the scientific miracles in the Quran, and that sort of thing appeals to me because I'll have to bring my science game uh, and show in a roundabout way uh, the, the problems with, with dogmatic beliefs of any sort. Um, uh, but yes, uh, I even faced that problem with some of the sort of left-oriented uh, population where they go, well, you know, uh, the, the very infamous conversation conversation between Sam Harris and Bill Maher, Ben Affleck, where um, uh, the whole thing is perceived as uh, the, the Christianity is a white man religion and uh, Muslims is, is the religion of minorities. And therefore, when you attack their faith, you're kind of attacking minorities in a way. But they don't understand that, that when you leave Islam, you become, as you said in your own words, Zara, minority within a minority. And the reality becomes even harsher um, and it's a lot more difficult. So I'm, I'm motivated by the truth of the claim, uh, whether it's true or not. That's what I'm motivated about. Can it be helpful? Yes, we understand that religion has evolved with people and it helped different societies, especially if they are poor or ignorant. Um, and, and that's the only way they can deal with rea harsh realities. But um, as we advance humanity, uh, do we really need to, to have a tool of epistemology that tells you that you, can, you should believe things without good evidence? And ha that's a really good point in terms of like, um how you know challenging whether religion is needed now as well and questioning um its existence as well but harris if we if we turn those questions i guess if we turn the topic around back uh, to you do you can you highlight i guess your thoughts on where ex-muslims are minorities or the criticism of islam in places where muslims are minorities and how you can kind of also compare and contrast between where um, ex-Muslims in Muslim majority countries are minorities and the differences between that. I know there are harsher punishments, but I'd be keen to see if those punishments in a larger scale also apply in the West as well from communities. Yeah, so I think, I, first of all, um, my story is quite very similar to Hani's story as well. Um, most of my streams are in Urdu as well because um, I, I do want to target the Indian and Pakistani uh, communities and talk about that. And now it's kind of, you know, there's, there are already plenty of uh, channels that are talking, that, that are criticizing Islam in Urdu language, which is much needed. Um, but I get a lot of calls, a lot of letters. And I, I would say probably it's no exaggeration. I've received well over I'd say probably thousands of letters I've received and messages and call uh, where people are still extremely terrified of not insulting or criticizing Islam, just being ex-Muslim. And that's just in a Muslim majority country like Pakistan. Now, India is a slightly different. It is a secular country, but there's a huge Muslim presence there. So I just as a rule of thumb, I just say don't criticize Islam and be very careful about your situation and your where um, what can do, what kind of people are around you uh, because it's not worth it. Now, I the plight of ex-Muslims. I, I was just thinking that you could probably put it in three categories. Um, obviously, you're an ex-Muslim in a Muslim majority country, and as you rightfully pointed out, that uh, the punishments are there much harsher. Um, you, you can pretty much lose your life um, or go away to prison for for, for a relevant number of years. Like uh, you're basically as good as dead. Um, but then you have uh, two kinds of ex-Muslims in Western countries, I guess. Um, uh, the, if you're an ex-Muslim who is still surrounded by a lot of Muslims, Muslims who take their Muslim identity very seriously, um, so you are still in danger. Yes, you're not being hunted down by a state, but you have Muslim parents, family members, you have Muslim um, family friends, and even Muslim neighborhoods. So you are still almost 
you feel like you are in a Muslim majority country because anything can happen to you at, uh, at that point. And we've seen plenty of, I know there's anecdotal evidences, um, uh, sorry, anecdotal evidence where you can see so many uh, ex-Muslims have been beaten up in various uh, Western countries. And then there's a third category of ex-Muslims, people, I, I guess, Hani and I fall into that. I've never had any problem uh, being an uh, being an ex-Muslim in Australia, that's probably because I never lived in a Muslim neighborhood. I have some Muslim friends, um, but I'm not really that close or we don't really talk about Islam, but I've had, you know, friends from all walks of life and all nationalities. So, so it doesn't really impact me as much. Um, so it depends where these ex-Muslims are. Muslim countries, ex-Muslims, there is no question about that. Their lives would be endangered. I would say just keep your mouth uh, shut and Try to get out. That's the only advice I can give you. Um, but the other one, as I said, uh, even in these Western countries, you can have severe consequences. Uh, it's not that easy to be an ex-Muslim um, if you fall in the second category. Um, I actually have a follow-up question, Harris. Um, for Muslim, for ex-Muslims in Muslim-majority countries, where obviously they need to be quite secretive about who they are because there's a crime out there do you th i think we've seen multiple reports of a community growing of atheists like in iran um in saudi as well but at the same time in places like bangladesh where there is a community growing we also see that there are there are hunts like there there would be like an atheist hunt or in egypt for instance very similarly an atheist hunt they also have a gay hunt where people use a gay dating app to fish out people. Um, do you think that, and, and I'm not putting this on any of us, but I do you think that while our advocacy on YouTube increases the reach to other people in their languages or even in English can sometimes be a backlash because the authorities are becoming more aware? Uh, sorry, um, backlash on us or the ex-Muslims? the ex-Muslims in the country because right. of the consumption of our videos. Oh, yes. um, I'm, I'm not saying that we're the sole people that are responsible, but I think we are bringing enlightenment in our own ways and books, there are books, and there are people who just read other things or they just think about it. But do you think that now the governments are employing different schemes of um, reducing atheism or like doubling down into like youth programs and a softer approach so they can still keep people in the religion? Well, I'm a, I can only talk about Pakistan. Uh, so in Pakistan, we've had, we've had great results in a way that now we have penetrated uh, the Pakistani society so much so that they are specifically holding seminars like these motivational speakers these big name social media influencers they go to universities and they actually say countering atheism every major pakistani cleric has has spoken about atheism and rising atheism within the ranks of uh, uh, of their brothers in arms um, so they are wor worried about that so we do see that uh, unfortunately yes there are some uh, terrible stories out of that too. Uh, there was one person who used to listen to, who used to consume content, uh, atheist content, and um, he knew me. And unfortunately, he was actually lynched by a mob. I made a video about him, but I didn't really say that because his parents were saying that he was not an ex-Muslim or he was not an atheist. Um, so it does worry me as an influencer that if, uh, if, if we're doing something, is it going to end up costing someone's life? Um, the, the problem here is, is basically, and, and that's sorry, tying it back with your first question. The problem is with Islam and then within, with, with the Muslim community. Muslims are a very insular, uh, inward looking kind of uh, a community. They, they have a problem with dissent in general. It's not just apostasy. If there is a, if there is a uh, young woman who doesn't say she's an ex-Muslim, well, she's probably not an apostate either, but she doesn't toe the line. She doesn't do as she's told. She doesn't wear a burqa or a hijab. Then she's going to face significant um, amount of backlash from her own family, from her own circles. 
Um, if someone turns out to be gay, well, that's it. The, being gay is obviously that that's actually worse than being an atheist. Um, uh, e even if you're a disobedient child who doesn't look after his family, uh, so that he would be shamed and ostracized and alienated as well. So all these, uh, the, the, this is a common problem with very conservative, but mostly with conservative um, society communities and societies. And unfortunately, Muslims. Um, Uh, the worst when it comes to that. Now, that is obviously not to say that all like that. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there are, there, it's bound to happen. There's going to be some backlash uh, because as the ex-Muslim community grows, um, it, it's going to get worse. One, one question, uh, so I, I just remember a part of, to answer your question, if the governments are going to double down. I recently found out that not the Pakistani government doing that, Uh, there are some uh, vigilante organizations. There's a there's a famous organization, very hawkish about the about defending the honor of uh, the Prophet, called TLP in Pakistan. Massive party. I think a lot of people know about it. They actually now this is one obviously this is this is one story that I can uh, I can tell you. There was an ex-Muslim guy who was in a WhatsApp group. He exited the group about a year ago, uh, but then someone in from that group or the, they found out the details of all the members and they honey trapped him. They got a woman to send him messages and she, in, she, she trapped him over a period of a month or something, got him to blaspheme. And then he turned up um, uh, uh, for the date. And then he, uh, and, and then there were the uh, Pakistani federal police there waiting for him. And then they arrest him. So that was like a sting operation. Now again, that, that it, it wasn't it wasn't by the government, but the TLP is pretty big. So so yeah, I think they they're gonna try everything. It is unfortunate if you and this is why I always say if you're if you're living in a Muslim country, it's probably not worth it. Just just you know um, keep it on the keep low. your head down. Yeah. yeah, and I, and I guess on the topic of um, governments or different groups employing different approaches, Hane, I I I know um, you might have a thought on this. So in in the event, like when we talk to when you talk about Harris's first example, where they have these seminars that are like, this is how we counter atheism. Um, but now also more Muslim women and men are going on podcasts and they're having more like they're preaching, they're, they're doing dawah in their own way um, and really using a lot of the woke terminology as well. And by woke, I mean, I don't mean maybe not woke terminology. I'm going to correct that and say liberal terminology. So they would talk about toxic femininity or toxic masculinity. A lot of this buzzwords that younger people see on social media. And now a lot of conservatives have taken the podcast um, and they're spitting it around to create more audiences and to make the religion in any religion, like Christianity has this too, more enticing and employing different ways. What are your thoughts on like, We're obviously for free speech, so we accept that, you know, they should have a platform, or at least I think that we are mm -hmm. uh, for the same position. But how do you think we can best counter it? Or how, do, I mean, I know creating content isn't, but how do you think we can best um, talk about these issues where, you know, religious uh, conservatism is coming to social media? I think it's quite positive. I think it's a great thing. I think, I think... The fact that people have finally stopped and wanted to think about whether they're pro or cons, uh, you know, for or against the, the conversation, the fact that they're actually looking up the material, trying to read them for themselves and trying to reproduce them in a way that could be understood by many, I think it's a positive thing. Finally, religion is is out of uh, out of the cave. It's no longer hiding. It's out for scrutiny positive or negative, and that's what, what I like. But I'll give you a couple of examples. Al-Azhar uh, um, University and Al-Azhar uh, establishment in Egypt, you know, the biggest Sunni, uh, influential, very influential, uh, along with Saudi Arabia, who is kind of uh, talking about Saudi Arabia is kind of changing in a very dramatic way or in recent times. Uh, and Egypt has become more conservative than Saudi Arabia <laughs> these days. But they have um, started a call center, uh, I think spent $30 million dollars 
uh, taking calls of, uh, <laughs> and I, when I first heard the news, I thought it was, that's funny, but it's, uh, that's how they're countering it. They, they're open that call center and people who are a bit hesitant or not quite sure, they can give them a call and say, hey, my faith is a bit shaky. Can you try to steady me up? And, uh, uh, and I thought that was a, a funny thing. And the taxpayers, as imagine if you're uh, an atheist taxpayer in, in Asia, you still have to pay for that <laughs> one way or another. Uh, but, um, uh, Things like, but but I think content like that. I think this is this is brilliant. I think for anything to be out in the open and let the truth sort of speak for itself, it's going to be evidence provided on both sides. And uh, for those who are sitting on the fence, they're go it's the perfect time to be alive because they're going to watch contents from people saying Islam is the solution to everything apparently, and those who are saying well. Uh, no, it's a horrible dogma and it's evil. And those who, like me, would say, no, we understand religion in terms of evolution of humanity. It was needed when people were ignorant and afraid. But now we've developed better tools to understanding reality around us. Is it useful uh, to, to, in this day and age? I don't think so. And we provide evidence. So I think it's a positive thing that it's been talked about. No, so, but do, do you think that um, with more conservative ideas being out there, like on many different contexts, that a lot of younger people, I think previously I would have assumed a lot of younger people would turn to be more liberal because we appreciate freedom once we know what that is. But I've kind of seen the balance go off or be an equal split where a lot of young people are going towards conservatism and well, religion being one of them. I think uh, you can't hide ideas. Uh, the only way to choose liberalism is, is to be able to contrast it with something else. I think everything needs to be out in the open. Uh, everything should be discussed because if you are going to direct people toward being liberal by hiding conservative views, then you're not doing anything other than another way of indoctrination and dogma. We uphold the views that everything, if, if, if an idea is good enough to stand on its own feet, then it should not be afraid of scrutiny or competition for that for for that so for the for the same reason natural selection that does touch ideas and means the equivalent of genes coined by Richard Dawkins um, is 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 again subject to natural selection so uh, it's going to be survival of the fittest of the better ideas and I guess having those two ideas in plain sight do you or either of you have you personally felt that when you talk about, you know, liberalized ideas or atheism, especially coming from a Muslim background as well, that you are likely to encounter being silenced more than those conservative ideas that come from Muslims instead. So in my opinion, I've noticed a lot of liberals pander towards Muslims especially because they see them as minorities and they need to be protected. I think, Hani, you mentioned like the criticism of the, um, the criticism of Islam is conflated with uh, Muslims because they're a minority. Um, but do you feel like, just like uh, Ben Affleck's example, that a lot of, uh, even now, I think that was what, in 2015, so it's uh, 80 years now, um, we still find that same issue where liberals do tend to censor us more than they would have with those conservative ideas existing because we must respect yeah. them. The, the, and that's the problem, I think, and I, I would love to hear Harris's uh, uh, views on, on, on after I've just, I've got a minute to speak here and I'll give him yield to the floor. But um, atheism is, is just the one idea about one thing and it should not be conflated with other things because you can, I think you can be conservative atheist. And I think as a matter of fact, you've got Atheist for Liberty speaking at some point, and you will have a, a very young and bright gentleman who is, a is atheist, but conservative political views. Some people saying, well, if you're an atheist, this is the umbrella that you should fall under. These are the, 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 the few categories that you must believe if you're an atheist. And I disagree with that because the, the, the term atheist is just, the, the, you know, you, you're not convinced that God exists, and that's about it. You can still be a horrible person ethically, and you know you can adopt very bad ethical views. Um, it, it depends on how you see ethical views, 
Um, and uh, it, it's not guarantee for anything. You still have to rebuild your life views, your politics, your morality, everything else. Um, uh, so I, I argue that um, uh, being conservative is not necessarily bad. Uh, it needs to be argued and it needs to be contrasted with other views. And which one is a better way to yield a better society in today's reality, in terms of science, in terms of endeavor, in terms of the quality of life? It's We no longer just want to live. We want to live good. We want to have a good life. And that context can change everything. Harris, did you have an opinion on it? I, I, I think it's, I think it's old news that liberals uh, try to silence us or something. They, they may still not share their uh, share a flaw with us, um, but I've, I've always said it, said it that this is an unholy alliance and it's not going to last very long. People have known this that if you, you know, it's very easy to show, educate liberal activists or liberal politicians to tell them that, hey, the very LGBTQ friendly um, or pro-abortion, pro-life um, uh, values that you're promoting, Muslims don't like it. Uh, Muslims don't really have an opinion on uh, abortion as strongly as some Christians do, but, 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 but generally, uh, Muslims and Islam is not a liberal doctrine. So I, I, I always said that this is an unholy alliance. The Ben Affleck thing was eight years ago, and th there's so many liberals who do confront um, when, when push comes to shove, they, they do do it. I'm worried about a different kind of an alliance. That, that would be unholy alliance two, um, number two. Uh, it's the, that I've seen Christians and fundamentalist Christians and Muslims teaming up, especially in America. That I've seen a lot of these uh, Twitter spaces, these uh, the, these clubhouse groups, and where they are they are finding a common ground. For example, liberalism has come up with all kinds of other challenges as well. Um, you know, there's a dating problem. There's this toxic masculinity problem, apparently, and toxic femininity problem. Feminism has gone to this, I don't know, ninth wave or something. And both Christians and fundamentalist Christian and fundamentalist Muslims don't like that. So they are finding a common ground in fighting against um, this wave of liberalism and this wokeism. So that is the um, that that's the alliance that I think we should be worried about. Uh, but that would not also that wouldn't last very long either, because again, those those religions don't like each other. Um, so I think that, that that's something we need to uh, uh, watch out for. Uh, as far as this liberals going easy on Muslims. I think yeah, that's still true to some extent because they don't want to antagonize, uh, you know, a hijabi girl. But they don't want to. They don't want a Muslim minority to feel like outsiders or whatnot. So, so, so that that part would always remain there. But when it comes to Muslims, are not passive people. If they believe in something, they're gonna shout from the top of the from, from rooftops. They're going to they're going to let you know that this is what they believe in. This is their opinion on LGBTQ. This is their opinion on dissent or apostasy, etc. So, at, so I always knew that at, sooner or later they're gonna they're gonna clash with with each other, and I think you're gonna see a lot more of that. But watch out for this Christian and uh, Muslim alliance. I think that's such an interesting point about this new unholy alliance. I guess it's not that new because it's happened in the past couple of years, like the Birmingham school protests on LGBT studies, apparently, um, where Christians and Muslims came together. And then they do on many different occasions as well, while fundamentally they hate each other. Um, it's getting, but, but it's getting bigger on, on another front this feminism issue they mm. they're saying this uh, because now you see this christian fundamentalists are agreeing with muslims that yes the you know fertility rates are going down people are not marrying enough or as they used to these women are getting out of our hands we can't control them divorce rates going through so now they're actually sh finding this common ground and muslims are like see we've been telling you liberalism is a curse so you're going to see a lot more of that, I mean, way beyond um, the, the fact that because Christians don't, they still don't feel about Jesus the way Muslims feel about Muhammad. So you might see these occasional alliances there on, on the issue of, uh, you know, like, oh, Jesus was 
people, someone made fun of Jesus or or, or, or whatnot. But they, yeah, but they're going to unite more against this feminism, what they call toxic femininity. Interesting. What would you say um, our approach should be here? I guess what, what would you say a more digestible approach should be for? one people from the outside who are neither of those religions and people or younger people because i know that that is your audience harris and i think honey you also speak to a lot of younger audiences or at least your youtube channel has been seen by a lot of the younger audiences what would you say is a more digestible response or approach to kind of speaking to them to think outside those realms so when I criticize religion, I criticize all religion. I just don't focus on Islam. Uh, I've got that multiple background anyway that I can use. So I'm very, very uh, well versed in, in Old Testament and New Testament. So when I talk about its faith and the problem with faith, which is believing in something without evidence or without needing to have an evidence for it. Obviously, they'll argue now we've got evidence, but uh, it, it depends on what you mean by evidence. Uh, to, to me, I attack that very point. I attack everything that the three Abrahamic religions share um, as the basis of my of the problem with the um, uh, with the whole believing without evidence. So I might sometime have a, a, a conversation about Islam, uh, the next day about Christianity, um, uh, Judaism, because you know one of the things you're going to be always and Harris probably will relate now uh, uh, if you're attacking Islam all the time. It's like oh, we never see you attack Judaism. You know, how much you make in a month? <laughs> it must be related, you know. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I, I wish that was true because we wouldn't have this fundraiser had it not been. Um... <laughs> Very oh, true. Yeah. But so what one way to attack it is to attack the very core. I mean, re re these religions have stemmed from ignorance, fear, and eventually uh, a, a very useful tool for control by people later on. So once you expose that as the whole, the, the trinity, um, the broader terms of, of religions, then they're all going to start sounding the same. Once you've you've you know you've you've uh, picked on the gods uh, sort of identity with one and three is it Allah the one or is it Elohim or all these types of gods, the very basis of all religions you'll you'll find they have lots in common. So that I believe uh, Harris has hit the nail on the head there. I think that alliance very pragmatic and we've seen it in history so many times even outside of religion. It is going to be for a time, but soon they are going to be. You know, having you know the, the 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 Tom and Jerry situation again. What about you, Harris? What do you think well, could be well, a potential way forward? Well, I think we've got to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, one thing is for sure: the modern world is going is so complex that it's going to have its issues that we're going to have to face. Um, but one thing that we need to tell people, and the, and I think people would know themselves as well, that whatever these problems are, the solution is not going to come from your conservative Christian or Islamic values. It's not going to come from there. Um, yeah, there the, the is a problem where people are becoming less social, people are becoming more materialistic, and I think they, people, that's been the case. Uh, it's always been the case. Um, but everything is happening so rapidly now at such a pace that we're coming up with problems far more frequently than we come up with solutions. Um, so I think we're going to keep going with the liberal world. We, we're going to keep um, uh, challenging conservative ideas. We're going to keep challenging these traditional values that we've seen it. We've been there. We've done that. We've seen that when you give uh, traditionalism or any religion, theocracies, when you give them a free hand, we know what kind of world we end up with. Yes, there is a problem uh, and nothing is just a temporary problem. People try to talk about wokeism and cancel culture and, you know, yes, there are some problems, but humanity is smart enough to work out a solution. We're going towards AI, um, you know, like falling fertility rate, whether that's a problem or not. Who knows? In 20 years time, that might not even be a problem. Um, nobody has a solution to what should be the ideal population of Earth. No, no nobody knows that. Um, so th th these problems that they create or they highlight, and then they say you need to come back to our Christian conservative values or our, 
or our uh, Islamic values, that would solve the problem of falling fertility rates. So uh, I, I, I'm not even convinced that, um, this is just one example, I'm not even convinced if that is going to be a problem, at least in the latter part of the century. So keep saying, keep promoting liberal values and humanity will come up with solutions. Great. Um, thank you so much for this chat. I'm afraid we're just on time. Um, this is really nice. Um, I'll end it recording now. Um, but before I end it, um, please donate. We're doing some amazing work. We're raising funds for ex-Muslims um, and we could use all the support. Um, please donate on our website or the link on the YouTube channel.